Um, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning. Um, there's so much truth, Lord God, that we're going to be going through, and I pray, Lord, that it would penetrate our hearts, that we would have a reason as to why we need to understand these things. And I pray, Lord, that again, as we are uh, exposed, Lord God, to your word, I pray that it would wash away some of the, the junk that's in our hearts and in our minds, and that it would cleanse us and purify us, sanctify us with your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so um, we're starting a new series. I know we didn't finish the book of Ephesians, but what we're doing is um, we're splitting the book of Ephesians in half, okay? So we cover chapters 1, 2, and 3, and then chapters 4, 5, and 6 we're actually going to cover after our conference. So we have the conference in April. We're going to be covering uh, the rest of Ephesians afterwards, okay? So what I want to do is I want to give you a brief overview of what Brett Conkle talked about, okay? So if you weren't here last week, okay, this man... Uh, actually came and spoke at our church, okay? Um, he was up here. And um, the reason why I like this picture is because I just think it's a funny picture. Uh, just imagine your dad taking a picture like this, okay? You'll know why I think it's funny. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so he was, he was our guest speaker last week. Um, he's actually the one that took us to Utah last year, okay? And I just want to point out, so if you look at this picture, he actually doesn't have another arm, right, in terms of the frame, the way it's framed. And there's no, like, I didn't zoom in or anything. Like, this is it, right? So when I wanted to Photoshop him here in the garden, I had to give him another arm because it looked weird if his arm was chopped off. So what I did was I took the other arm and I inversed it and I stuck it back on there, which is why it looks so weird. <laughs> and anyway, just wanted to point that out. I didn't get a chance to do that last week. So I just wanted to. Okay. But that said, um, if you guys at all remember what Brett talked about, he basically talked about um, the truth, okay? And he talked about relativism. Right? And he basically gave us a couple examples that were really helpful. One was in regards to ice cream, right? And he gave us the difference between subjective truth, okay, and objective truth, right? And so the pictures here are illustrations of how if he says something like, uh, you know, peanut, Reese's peanut butter ice cream is his favorite ice cream, that's a subjective truth, okay? That's an opinion that he has, right? It's truth for the person, it's true for the person that's speaking, okay? That's not necessarily true of everybody, right? But objective truth is what's true for everybody, or false for everybody, it's true for the thing itself, okay? So, um, even if he loves ice cream, if he has diabetes, taking ice cream and injecting it into his body is not gonna help solve the issue of diabetes in his body. What you need for diabetes is insulin, okay? So insulin is what helps somebody with diabetes, that's an objective truth statement. Whether or not you believe that insulin is the, the, the way in which you help di uh, people with diabetes, uh, the fact is that it does help them, okay? And so what he did was he divided up these two things for us so that we would have a better understanding, okay, of what truth actually is because we live in a day and age where relativism is what is the dominant theory of how we look at truth, that all truth is relative, okay? So what Brett did was he walked us through what he called the truth test, okay? And he gave us a bunch of statements and we were either to answer whether they were objective or subjective. Okay, so number one, is this objective or subjective? We'll just do a review, okay? This is objective, objective okay? This is true whether or not you believe it, okay? Um, the idea is that this is something that if, if someone is wearing a red shirt, whether I believe they're wearing a red shirt or not, it is true, it is objectively true, okay? Red is the best color, okay? This is subjective because it's an opinion, right? Three, two plus two equals four. Objective, objective because it's math. Uh, four, tropical island vacations are the best kind. Subjective. Subjective, okay. Uh, Brett can bench press 350 pounds. <laughs> this threw, threw you guys off last time too. So it's objective, okay, but it's objectively true or objectively false. Okay? Meaning my opinion does not change whether or not this is true or false. Okay? So if you took Brett to the gym, would he actually be able to do it? It doesn't matter if you believe it. Okay, this is not Peter Pan. I believe, I believe, clap your hands and then you can bench press 350 pounds. That's not how it works, okay? He will die. Um, <laughs> so will I. Um, okay, number six. Atoms consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Objective. It's objective, right? Now, what, we, what he did was he went into four more, okay? And the question is, God exists. Objective or subjective? Okay. Objective. Eight, Jesus is the only way to God and Jews are wrong. Objective. Premarital sex is wrong. It is wrong for women to have an elective abortion. Okay. So, you answer objective today, which is good, because it means you learned from last week. But last week, we were thrown off by this, right? It's because categorically, one through six, we have an easier time deciding what's objective and subjective. But seven, eight, nine, ten, those are in the realms of religion or theology, 
and morality. And so when we head into those regions of truth, all of a sudden we become relativists, right? We're not sure whether these things are objective. Because this stuff looks like opinion. We've been trained from a very young age to believe that these things are opinions. And so here's what I want to do today. Okay? I want to jump off of where Brett left us with, and I want to talk about why we believe this to be true. Okay? And it's because our culture, okay, if you imagine a two-story house, our culture is like this two-story house. And the things that are on the subjective floor, the second floor, okay, are different from the things that are on the objective floor, the first floor. So the objective floor are the important things, right? The things that determine how we live our lives. The subjective floor are things in there that are like opinions, things that we should keep to ourselves. It's part of our pride of life. And what we've done is we've put theology, religion, and morality into the subjective floor. We've done this as a culture, right? Not just individually, but we've done this as a culture, right? It's no longer okay to talk about religious things, mor uh, moral things, theological things, as if they were objectively true, okay? So it's very not PC to say, your religion is false, my religion is true, right? That would be something that you would get uh, marked down for if you were in class and you had to debate somebody or whatever, okay? Because it's just not acceptable to say those kinds of things. So the question is, when did this happen? And has it always been like this? First of all, it hasn't, okay? It hasn't always been like this. So what I want to do is I want to give you a quick little historical, philosophical lesson. And then kind of walk you through, what does the Bible have to say about all these things? Um, Brett ran a time last week and weren't, wasn't really able to get there, so I wanted to be able to finish that part for him. Okay. So, <clears throat> first thing that you need to know is that our current age, okay, the current philosophical age that we live in, is called the postmodern age. Okay. We as a culture, we as a Western philosophical age, we subscribe to postmodernism. Okay. So let me explain to you what this is. Okay. The last, um, uh, how many years has it been? 1,300 years, okay? Um, last 1,300, 1,400 years, okay? Have been divided up into five major philosophical ages, okay? So the first one is the medieval age. So we're talking 8th century all the way up to halfway of the 15th century, okay? And basically, the medieval time, philosophically speaking, was a time of explosive Christian thinking, okay? So this was a time when all of the philosophers were Christians, all of philosophy was based on biblical principles and values. And actually, education of people came through um, biblical means, and we call this the, the classical education system. So the classical education system is founded upon grammar, rhetoric, and logic, and that's how children were taught, that's how societies were grown. Okay? And by the way, when we talk about these ages, we're only talking about Western philosophy. We're not talking about Eastern philosophy. So the medieval times, when we talk about medieval, we're talking about Europe and, and all that. We're not talking about Asia and China and Korea. Okay? Um, Anyway, so medieval philosophy was, generally speaking, it was Christian. It was also the beginning of the university system, right? So people recognized that, wait, in order to really study these kinds of things well, we need to actually gather people together and have them dedicated to study. So let's make studying professionally an actual job, okay? So that's how the university came about. There were professors. There were people that taught these things, okay? So that's what happened during the medieval times. Now, the Renaissance rolls around, and you begin to have a small movement away from theology and faith, okay? And you have uh, people in the Renaissance kind of shaking off religious uh, sort of arguments for philosophy and different things like that. And by the time you come to the age of reason, okay, um, you have a lot of movement away from uh, specifically Christian ways of thinking. And so by the time you hit the Enlightenment, you have in places like France, Britain, and Germany, you have a dividing of the mind in terms of, okay, philosophy can be largely or loosely religion-based, but then things in regards to society. So the Enlightenment period is really when you begin to have the divide between the second floor and the first floor, okay? It's when people begin to say, you know what? There are things that belong in the second floor, and we think oftentimes, when it comes to really important things like government and stuff, the religious stuff should go up into the second floor. That begins to happen in the Enlightenment, okay? And then you have the last 100, 150 years, what we call modernity, okay? And modernity is when basically atheistic, secular philosophy completely takes over, okay? If you go to a college course and you study philosophy 101 and you start to go into the lower division philosophy classes, you're pretty much gonna be exclusively talking about modernity, okay? And all the philosophers that come out of that, and 99% of them are atheistic, okay? 
right? Nietzsche came out of there, Marx came out of there, right? So a lot of um, the atheistic ideas, communism, all of that stuff's kind of being born during this time of modernity. Let's get God out of the future completely. Let's not even just get him in rid of the second floor. Let's just put him in the roof or kick him out of the house altogether. That's the idea of modernity, okay? We happen to live in a time called postmodernism, which is taking place after 1950 and beyond, okay? And postmodernism is the idea that not only is truth all relative, there is no absolute truth, okay? And that's where we are now. And it's interesting because um, there's a book called Closing of the American Mind, and it says this. There's one thing a professor can absolutely be certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes, or says he believes, that truth is relative. Okay, so Alan Bloom, this is, he, he wrote this. Okay? You know when he wrote this? He wrote this in 1987. Okay? So in 1987, people were already uh, aware of the fact that in terms of the educa education system in America, most people going into college were already sure that truth was relative. So the question is, where did this come from? It came from a lot of different places, but basically our culture moved in this direction. So you, okay, were not taught relativism um, just because it was something that the teachers taught you. You were taught relativism because this is the air we breathe, this is the water that we swim in, right? I've used this analogy before. Does a fish know he's wet? No, until you kick him out of the water and he realizes that he needs to go back into the water. And so it's the same for us. Relativism, truth is relative, all of this is a part of the culture that we live in. It's very difficult to know anything else. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do is I want to tell you how we define postmodernism. Okay? So, two things. The first one is sort of the official definition. So it's postmodernism is basically the philosophy that truth is biased and socially constructed. <coughs> so therefore, if it exists at all, it is culturally bound. Okay? Basically, the culture gets to make the truth. Whatever truth the culture agrees upon, that becomes whatever truth it is. Right? So what's true for me is what's is maybe not what's true for you, but we can still call both of those things true. Okay? Uh, but the pop definition, the one that I think is most compelling, is what I feel is all that counts because what I feel is all there is. What I feel is all that counts because what I feel is all there is. Now, how did this happen in America? Right? Because think about it. Uh, when America was founded, when the United States of America was founded, where did it come from? It's not like the Native Americans here decided to do this. It's that there were people in Europe, right, specifically the pilgrims, who were feeling religiously persecuted. And so what did they do? They moved to the colonies that were here. Right? And so America actually started out 13 colonies. There was the revolution and all that stuff. And we drafted the you know, uh, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and all that stuff. But basically, it was founded upon Protestantism. Because those were the people that came over. They wanted religious freedom, they wanted to come here and enjoy their Protestantism without any limits. They wanted to be a Christian culture, a Christian society, they kind of wanted to go back towards that. So they basically ran away from Europe, right, and they planted here. And as time continued, and as the uh, expansion continued of the United States, right, you had more and more of this country sort of being founded upon generally Protestant ideas and values. But right around the 1950s, a little bit before then, you started to have a lot of immigration, right? And so people are now coming from all over the world, coming to the United States because there was religious freedom, right? That was one of the things that the um, founding fathers made sure was cemented into the documents of the, our government, that there would be religious freedom. And so people were persecuted all over the world. They would come to the United States because of religious persecution. And so what was once, you get to worship whoever you want to, and I get to worship whoever I want to, that began to change in the 1950s. And you know what it turned into? It turned into your religion and my religion are equal. Right? We're the, we're, they're basically the same. Mine's not better than yours. Yours is not better than mine. We'll just keep our distance. We'll just hold to whatever. But it eventually became your God and my God are the same. Right? How many of you guys have heard other people talk about religions all being the same? Right? Everyone worships the same God. It's all roads lead to the same mountain. Right? And the idea is that that's actually incorrect. Even if you study... Religion, for five seconds, you'll know that that's not correct. Let me give you a five-second primer on how that I know that's not correct. Look at the views of Jesus between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Right? <coughs> Muslims believe Jesus is not God. Christians believe Jesus is God. There's a huge difference between the two. Right? And then, what did the Jews say about Jesus? He was just a good teacher. Right? He was not the Messiah. Again, differences between the three. And so, if we say all religions are the same, then what we're doing is essentially we're erasing, right, 
what makes each religion distinctive. And we can't talk about what the differences are. We lose the ability to do that. Okay? So we live in a culture right now that has basically moved from declaring truth in any aspect, but especially in regards to religion and theology and morality. And basically what everything comes down to is what I feel is all that counts because what I feel is all there is. And so into this culture, I want to show you guys what the Bible says about this and how we begin to think about this, okay? So turn with me to uh, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And we're just going to read a few verses, verses 6 through 8. Verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Okay. So here's the thing that you need to understand um, when it comes to postmodernism. Uh, Ravi Zacharias, the great apologist and the, the founder of RZIM Ministries, who was a part of our Truth Matters Conference last year and the year before, um, they, he has this, this amazing story about how one time he was traveling uh, and was going to speak at this college. Okay? And this college had a building that was famous for the fact that it was the first postmodern building okay, in the United States. Okay? And so the architect was a postmodern architect. And so Ravi Zacharias asked him, asked the tour guide, what do you mean by postmodern building? And he began to describe this building. So this building is not built with like straight edges. There's no 90 degrees or whatever. Everything's off by a little bit. There are staircases that go to nowhere. There are structure poles that aren't structure poles. They're just poles that are in the middle of the room, right? It's just kind of wacky. And he just kind of designed it however he wanted to without any purpose, without any design, okay? And this was called the first postmodern building. It's this idea, just throw a bunch of stuff in and just see what happens. And then Robbie Zacharias made an interesting point. He said, okay, the building might be postmodern, but what about the foundation? Right? Is the foundation postmodern? Right? Can you design a foundation for a you know, four or five story building without using real physics, without using real measurements, without using real mathematics? And the answer is, of course not. Because if you did, what would happen to the building? It would fall, it would collapse. There are rules. There is a foundation that needs to be laid in order for you to do all the crazy stuff on top. But if you mess with the foundation, the whole building comes down. Right? And so what Colossians 2, 6 through 8 is teaching us is that there is something that we need to be rooted in. Look at verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. How is it that we address postmodern concerns? Right? And what are postmodern concerns? Colossians Verse 6 gets it right, 2-6. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Right? And what's really interesting is this verse actually mirrors a little bit uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1-3. through three. Just, It's up here, you can read it. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working, the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Right? It's this idea that there are three things that we as Christians struggle with. It's, the, it's our flesh, it's our own passions and desires, it's the world, right? and then it's the demonic spirits. And you see in Colossians 2.8, the same things pop up. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, that's the philosophy of the world, according to the elements of spirits of the world, according to the demonic forces, the influences that are around us, and not according to Christ. See to it that no one takes you captive, okay? See to it that no one takes advantage of your own flesh and your own desires to get you to get sucked into the world's philosophy, Satan's philosophy, okay? And postmodernism is that, because what postmodernism does is it pushes God out of the picture. And what does Satan want more than anything? It's not so much for you to hate God. He just doesn't want you to believe that God exists. He doesn't want you to, he wants you to doubt who God is. I mean, isn't that the first temptation, right? When Adam and Eve were in the garden, what does Satan do to get Adam and Eve to eat the fruit? He tells them, did God really say that you're going to die? 
I don't think so. I think God's trying to hide something from you. I think God's trying to keep you from something really awesome. That was the lie Satan gave. And so what did Adam and Eve do? They ate the fruit. They got sucked into that lie. Postmodernism is the same thing. This idea that truth is relative, this idea that you can do whatever you want, you can think however you want, that is not correct. It leads to dangerous things. Right? But I talked about how relativism undermines sin, it undermines morality, it undermines justice. Right? And so what I want you to do is I want you to see what is the solution for this. Okay? How is it that we train ourselves? Right? We're fish in the water of postmodernism. We don't even know that that's what we believe. And yet, again, it came out last week when we were doing the truth test. A lot of you guys weren't sure whether statements like God exists is subjective or objective. Well, verse 6 tells us, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. That's number one. How do we prevent ourselves from falling into the deep end of postmodernism? Number one, walk in him. What does it mean to walk in Christ? Have a relationship with Christ. Having a relationship with somebody does what? It makes you understand that they exist. Right? You can't have a relationship with a God that does not exist. You only have a relationship with God, a relationship with a God that actually exists. Okay? And all throughout the Bible, when it says, so-and-so walked with the Lord, it means that they had a relationship with God. Okay? So, number one, receive Christ Jesus as Lord, walk with Him, and then it says, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught. Okay? So, the thing that you need to understand is in order to reverse the effects of postmodernism, in order to roll backwards, right, and come to a place of truth, you need to know what the Word of God says. You need to be rooted, built up, established in the faith, just as you were taught. Okay? So the things that you're learning on Fridays and on Sundays, the things that you are learning in your own Bible readings, as you guys have, most of you guys have the ESV Study Bible, because we've been pushing that for years, so you don't read the Bible incorrectly. You have notes from scholars right there to help you read through what does this mean, what does this mean, what does this mean. As you do that and as you study that stuff together um, with the Holy Spirit by your side, helping you to understand God's word, you are being rooted and built up and established in the true faith. Okay? And then lastly, and this is interesting, it says abounding in thanksgiving. Okay? So it's like the solution is if you don't want to have... Be the kind of person that's lost in relativistic truth and there is no absolute truth. If you don't want to be lost in those things, you have to have a relationship with Christ. You have to know what he said in his word. And then it says you have to be abounding in thanksgiving. Now, why is that there? It's because without being thankful to God, you are going to get sucked into captive philosophy and empathy. And what we mean by that is this. Do you believe that God did something wonderful for you? Do you believe that God did something wonderful for you? If you do, then you're going to be the kind of person that wants to walk with him. You're going to be the kind of person that wants to do Bible study with him. You're going to be the kind of person that wants to engage with his word. But here's the truth. If you're not doing any of that, right? Some of you guys are playing games on your phones. You're not paying attention. It's because you don't have any thanksgiving for what God has done. Because you've been, you bought into the lie that you're not that bad. That you're not that much of a sinner. That you're not a terrible person that's going to be in view of God's wrath. Right? One of the uncomfortable things that we don't like talking about at church is hell. But hell is a reality. It's true. If you haven't submitted your life to God, you are actually going to go to hell because you're a sinner. That's uncomfortable. We don't want to hear that stuff. Right? And so a lot of churches actually stop talking about that. And the churches that still do, like what I'm doing right now, we're labeled as mean and unkind. But the truth is, we have to talk about this stuff because that's what reality actually is. But here's the thing. If you know how bad it is on that side, when you know what Jesus has done for you, then you will abound in thanksgiving. Right? How is it that we get captivated by Jesus? How is it that our minds aren't captured by all this uh, junk philosophy that's out there? It's when our minds are captivated and thankful to God. See, if you think in your life that something's missing, that God somehow owes you something, then you're going to be angry and you're going to be bitter at God. If you're angry and bitter at God, you're going to do and you're going to fall into philosophy that pushes him out of your life. It's very easy to do that. And so we need to be careful of that and we need to have an attitude check. So I love that Paul, who wrote the book of Colossians, he knows it's not just what you know up here, but it's so important what you develop. And this is why over the last couple of weeks, like we've been trying to get you guys to understand how much God loves you. And if you understand God's love for you, and you understand what it is that he's done for you, you understand the gospel, the good news, then it's so much easier to walk with him, to be rooted, and to be built up with him. And that's what we want. Okay? Because what happens is, if you fall into lies, 
and you fall into basically what our culture is telling you about who God is, then you're going to believe in untrue ideas. You're going to believe in false ideas. False ideas that are going to take your mind captive, help you doubt the goodness of God, help you to doubt whether or not you're a sinner. They're going to, uh, you're, going to, you're going to believe lies about the nature and the character of God, right? Um, in your own life, God is going to be diminished in his holiness. You're going to be puffed up in your own self-righteousness. All of these things are bad. Okay? And all of these things distance us and separate us from God. Okay? Now, why is this important? Why is it important that we talk about this, even though it's not like the most interesting thing in the world? The reason why we need to talk about this is because this is where we are as a culture and this is where we are as a nation. Right? Jeremiah 7.28 is something really interesting. So Jeremiah is a book where it's not good news, right? There's a lot of bad news in the book of Jeremiah because the Jeremiah was a prophet who basically had to come to Israel and had to proclaim the truth to them, that God is angry with you, right? You have not pleased God. You have sinned against God. Come and repent and receive forgiveness. And the people of Israel rejected Jeremiah and they rejected God over and over and over again. That's what the book is. It's kind of a sad book, okay? But there's something in there that I thought was really interesting that I think applies to us and our country. It says, this is, uh, and you shall say to them, this is the nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord their God and did not accept discipline. Truth is perished. It is cut off from their lips. So how did God punish Israel? He made truth perish. He made truth disappear. Meaning the Israelites had no standard for where they could talk about God any longer because they had subscribed to all of the other idols, all of the other gods, and all of the other cultures. They didn't even know how to talk about God anymore. That's one of the reasons why they rejected Jeremiah. Who are you, Jeremiah, to be speaking for God when we hear the voice of God on our own? So the punishment that they receive is that truth has perished. And what's crazy is this is exactly what's happening in our country now. And it has been for the last 60 to 70 years. We're not living in a time of, of a blessing and of, of, of um, flourishing. We are living in a time of judgment. Because truth has disappeared from our culture. It is cut off from the lips. A lot of your friends, and definitely a lot of college students today, they can't even hear the truth. It literally makes them angry and violent. Do you know how many colleges right now are erupting in all these kind of protests? Right? Because they're demanding all of these things from these colleges? It is craziness out there. And it's crazy because these college students, they can't hear the truth anymore. They can't see that their actions are ultimately um, destructive. They don't see any. Right? And so what's happening is there's a culture shift and there's a culture change, and you guys need to know what's going on. You need to know that this is what's happening. Right? So what do we do? Right? There's, a, there's a subset of Christianity that says, well, we just got to get on our knees and we just got to pray. I agree with that, but I don't think it ends there. I think that God has called us right, to do something about this. Right? This is why this text is here. It's so clear. Truth is perished. So what do we do? Right? Um, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. Now, the, the Chronicles is an interesting book. Um, it kind of goes back through uh, First Kings and Second Kings. It's almost a mirror of the two. But in this particular passage, um, the Bible talks about David before he becomes king. Okay? So before David becomes king, he's chased around by Saul. Okay? So Saul is the current king, first king of Israel. He's jealous of David, and he wants to kill him. And so, he's, by the way, it's insane jealousy. Okay? Can you imagine if President Obama didn't like somebody and said, you know what, uh, Joe Biden, why don't you lead the country? I'm going to go out. I need to kill this guy. Okay? That's what Saul does. Right? So Saul leaves his uh, uh, kingly duties to go and chase after David. Now, David, as he's running away from Saul, he begins to absorb all these stragglers and rebels and crazy people. Right? So all these men that are like living in caves and that are like outcasts of society, they begin to be attracted to David because David's running away also. And so they begin to look towards David as their leader, and he begins to gather this sort of ragtag group of men. And eventually these men become trained, and they become like uh, war generals, and they become all these like really uh, uh, great proud people. Okay? And they were called the mighty men of David. That's what they were known as. Uh, in Israel. So I don't know if you guys watch wrestling in the 80s. Me and my brother, we used to watch a lot of wrestling. They were like, like, like Hulk Hogan and Macho Man and Ultimate Warrior. Like, they were like these kinds of guys, right? And so they were the ones that like, people wrote, wrote songs about the mighty men of David. Well, there was a group okay, of the mighty men of David, and we're going to read about them here. And it says of them, and of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, 
The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. Okay. So basically, there was a group from the tribe of Issachar, who was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And these were men that had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Now this is important because when David was becoming king, he went out to his mighty men and he said, I need you guys to go out and I need you to recruit the best and the brightest to come join me to be a part of my government that I'm going to set up. And one of the groups that come over are these men that had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. So here's the deal. If we know that our country is in judgment because the truth has perished, then in order for us to transform that, in order for us to change that, we at our church need to be men that have an understanding of times to know what we ought to do. Now, the mission statement for our ministry is impacting the young church for the mission and the glory of God. And the reason why I chose this is because I want you guys to understand, you are not the future church. You are the church right now. You just have to be younger and most of you can't drive. Okay? But impacting the young church for the mission and glory of God, that's what we're about. So here's the deal. I know what's going on in our culture. I study this. I'm really, really passionate about this stuff because I have kids. And my Caden and my Isabella and, by the way, my future son. Okay, we're having a son. My future son is going to be growing up in a world where the truth has perished. And my job as a father is to make sure that they understand the times so that when it comes around for them to learn bad ideas, they have in their mind good ideas to push those bad ideas out. And not only do I want them to be able to push bad ideas out, I want them to be so informed that wherever it is they go, they teach and show other people the truth. But I don't want that just for my kids. I want that for you guys. I want that for our church. Right? It's why we do things like the Truth Matters Conference, and why it's so important to me, and why I fight for stuff like this. How many of your friends' churches are doing things? I know, because I've looked around, and no one's doing it, so we're doing it, right? We have to, right? If we understand the time, if we have an idea of what's going on, then it's our obligation to step up. It's our obligation to be called to do this. Some of you guys, I know, you don't want to. You don't want to be a part of a ministry that's always challenging you guys to preach the gospel, to evangelize, to talk to your friends about these kinds of things. But the truth is, God's put us here for a reason. God's gathered every single one of you guys for a reason to gather so that we would learn the truth, so that we can preach the truth and spread the truth wherever it is that we would go. Because the culture is not going to change on its own. The culture is going to change when men who understand what's going on know what the country ought to do. My hope and goal, and I don't know how many of you guys understand this, but we have at our church people that go to Ivy League colleges, all the top colleges. That's the influence of our church. I realize that. It took a couple years to realize that, but that's the influence of our church. So when you guys go out and you go to these places where you have influence, I want you guys to be influencers for the gospel, for the kingdom, for the glory of God. Right? And that's what the Truth Matters Conference is. It's a leadership conference this year to teach you guys the biblical worldview so you're equipped to go out and do that very thing. Right? Our speakers, for example, this year, Michael Shore, I wrote a book called Relational Apologetics. This is not just you know, proof of why God exists and stuff, but it's also a book on how to talk to your friends about this stuff. That's what we need. We need to be trained in this. If you believe that God exists and your friend doesn't believe that God exists, how do you go and talk to them about those things? So Michael's going to be teaching us that stuff. And what he does actually right now is he's not only a pastor, he's not only a, uh, a worship leader, artist, but he's also the head of an organization called Ratio, Ratio Christi Prep. It's a Latin term. Okay? Um, it means uh, Ratio Christianity. Okay? So Ratio Christi Prep, what he does is he gathers with high school students all across the nation to go out and either start Christian clubs or infiltrate those Christian clubs so that those Christian clubs are evangelizing. Because okay? the truth is, so many of our Christian clubs sit around and do nothing except get together, be Christian, eat lunch together, not curse, pray, and then leave. Okay? And that's a waste of time. Right? That's not why Christian, kid, Christian groups should be gathering on campus. They should be gathering to pray, to each other, pray for each other, encourage each other, and then go out and spread the gospel. There are people outside of that lunchtime that are spiritually dying. Right? And so we need this kind of training. It's essential that we have this kind of training, right? Second speaker is a uh, pastor named Caleb Kaltenbach. He wrote a book called Messy Grace. This, by the way, is his personal story, right? And his testimony is just absolutely incredible. When he was two years old, his parents got a divorce, right? His dad became involved in an active homosexual relationship. His mom became active in a lesbian relationship. And they basically were at the top of the LGBT activism, right? From, his, from the moment he was two years old, this is what he was involved in. 
And at some point in junior high, he decided he was going to go to a Bible study. And he wanted to go to a Bible study because he wanted to tear down the Christians that were making fun of him and making fun of his parents. And you know what happened? God saved him. He became a Christian and he became convinced that this is actually the word of God. And so that created distance between him and his parents. But over the years, through the grace and the love that he had for his parents, you know what he did? He brought them to Christ. Very recently, they just became Christians. And this book is written in terms of his story. And I know, you guys have friends, there are people in this room that struggle with LGBT issues, right? And our job as a Christian is not to make fun of them, pull them out, just say nasty things to them. Our job is to love them, as we would with any sinner. But we have to learn how to do that. And we have to learn to be sensitive. We have to learn to be gracious. We also have to learn to stand in the truth and not compromise. And Caleb's story is that you can do both at the same time. You can stand firm in your convictions, but you can also preach and teach and have relationships with grace. And that's why it's called messy grace. Um, and then our last teacher, a gentleman named Greg Kogel, um, wonderful, amazing teacher, wrote a book called Tactics, and basically he's going to be coming and speaking to both our families and us together in the main sanctuary. I am so excited about this. So, so, so excited about this. I feel like I've been praying for something like this for years, that we would be able to sit together with our parents and hear about how we as a church together can affect change in our culture. Think about this, okay? And I'm not being racist, but think about this, okay? When it comes to Asian American acceptance in the university systems across the US, we are the top 20%. It's just true. Look at all the statistics, okay? In fact, it's so true, it's to our disadvantage. Anyway, I don't want to get too lost. <laughs> it's true, okay? But the truth is, we are. So here's the thing. If our churches are training you guys to go to these top schools, to go to these top places, to know all of these things, we can affect change. How in the world did the United States become postmodern? The university system. How are we going to reverse that? When you guys know enough to go into those places, I want you guys to grow up to become the professors, to become the teachers, to become the judges, to become the Supreme Court justices, to become the people that affect change in our culture. My goal is so high, only God can do it. I'm not satisfied with just you being saved. God's going to do that as we preach the gospel every single day. But my goal is to see us affect change and for this place to be the center of life. And I'm so thankful for that. That's me abounding in thanksgiving for what God has allowed us to do. So this conference, when I tell you guys, share with your friends about it, tell your friends about it, blah, blah. I'm not saying that just so we can have a lot of people here. Look, if, if nobody comes, this teaching is still going to happen. And the people that come are going to receive amazing stuff. But if your friends are there with you and your other church friends, maybe who go to churches where they don't talk about this stuff, if they learn these things, we can start a movement. That's what we're trying to do. So over the last couple years, I've been able to connect with a few different pastors, and they're going to come. They're going to be here. But I need your guys' help. I need you guys to be talking about this on social media, asking your friends to register. That's why we're actually giving away a bunch of stuff, because we want you guys to register early and have a chance to win these kinds of things. Okay? Let's go ahead and close our eyes. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the ways in which you touch our lives, the ways in which you... Um, Show us the truth about how it is that we want to live. But God, I pray that there would be conviction in this room, that there would be a, a, a challenge in this room in our hearts that we would be willing to stand up and accept. And I pray, Lord, that as we have recognized that truth has disappeared from our country, I pray, Lord, that we would be truth warriors, fighting and standing firm in the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that the God of the universe is with us, behind us, and for us. I pray, Lord God, that again, as we continue, Lord, to learn about these things in the weeks to come, I pray, Lord, that we would really grasp onto the truth of who you are, what it is that you've done for us, and how you have changed our lives. I thank you so much for every single soul in this room. Whether they're paying attention or not paying attention, God, you have a plan and you have a reason why they're here. And I pray, Lord, for softened hearts. In Jesus' name we pray.